Hello, everyone. My guest today is Art Papas. He's the founder and CEO of Bullhorn, the global leader in software for the staffing and recruitment industry. He was the original architect of Bullhorn's flagship customer relationship management system, which now helps more than 10,000 companies around the world run their business. Art, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, you, you are early on to the game. So, so tell us first off, when you launched this company, what year and what are you working on today? Yeah, so we started Bullhorn in 1999. And uh, we were originally, uh, we were a online service, kind of like uh, if you've ever used or seen Upwork or Fiverr, we were, uh, we were an online marketplace. And specifically, we were focused on creative talent. And, uh, it, and um, it was really too early for that business model. So uh, it wasn't too early to get people to come online and build profiles and and uh, upload examples of their work, but it was really hard to get companies to hire those people over the internet to do freelance work, um, which now that seems like really common. And uh, it, I think it was just, like, we would go to sit with companies and they'd either A, say, we don't have internet connection in the office, which in 99 was like shocking, yeah. but okay. Uh, two, um, or they would say, I just don't trust the internet. And, um, which is ironic because what we pivoted to become was a, one of the early SaaS platforms. And I convinced people to put their business data on the internet, um, which arguably should have been harder, but I guess in the, the sort of year or so subsequent to us, uh, pivoting away from, uh, the marketplace and, and becoming a staffing software provider, um, you know, that the, the views the views changed, or I just got better at convincing people to trust the internet. So uh -huh. with that, I want to, I want to fit now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get where you're at today. And then the rest of the show, we're going to fill in the whole story in between. Okay. Sound good. So yeah. today, first off, you guys on track to do the 175 that you predicted. Uh, we beat that. Yeah. Okay, we're good. So what do you think? I know you're trying to get to, I think you said 220 by 2022 or something like that. What's the goal to end this year at? Yeah, we're way ahead of even that already. So. Okay, good. What's driven? What? So, so just to be clear, you're north of 200 million bucks in terms of AR run rate today. Correct. What drove the accelerated growth? You were making predictions as recently as a year and a half ago that it, you know, it'd take you till 2022 to hit that number. Um, well, we, uh, we continue to grow really, really quickly. Uh, and I am conservative. And so I tell somebody I'm going to do something. I like to do it. Um, and so I want to make it, I want to make it such that I, I don't have an interview and somebody says, Oh, did you do what you said you're going to do? And I, I said, well, not quite. Let me explain why. Yeah, no, you it's, uh, there's probably something to that. You, now this company has gone through many deals. We'll talk about how your conservative approach has, has given you leverage, uh, in those deals, uh, your historical deals to date. Um, but first off, one other data point from today, how many customers are you now serving? 10,000. Okay. Wow. And that's not like a fluffy duffy number. That's 10,000 paying customers. That 10,000 paying customers, um, majority are in the United States and, uh, and EMEA. And then we also have, I'd say um, Asia's emerging for us. So okay. that's still, still, uh, sort of a growth area for us. So 10 K customers into 200 million in AR fair to say average ACV is about that 20 grand mark. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's a good what it is. Let's yeah. fill in the backstory now. So 1999, you remember, uh, when the first was the first line of code written in 99. Yeah. I wrote the first line of code in 99, uh, in my apartment, uh, in Cambridge. Yeah. That was <laughs> okay. Apartment in Cambridge. And do you remember how much total kind of, uh, however you quantify it, how much you put into building the, N the MVP before your first dollar of revenue? Yeah. So, um, I, we spent about a year and a half and I probably coded every day for like, at least 60 hours a day, uh, for six days a week. Sometimes I would take, sometimes I would take Sundays off, I think, but like, yeah, it was pretty intense for a long time. And a lot of that was just wasted work trying to come up with products that people didn't want to use. Um, what's interesting is once, so one of our investors introduced me to our first customer and he said, oh, you, you had know, investors on day one. We did. Oh, yeah. wow. How much did you raise on day one? Uh, our initial angel round, um, was 1.4 million. Okay. So you were just like a smart guy that could really tell a story and that's what allowed you to get that money early. I couldn't tell a story. My co-founder <laughs> could, 
he was amazing. Uh, his network was amazing and he was an incredible salesperson and he very smart guy. And, uh, he and I went to pitch in investors and, um, you know, these were people who were like his, his, uh, boarding school friends and they were, um, like one was a hedge fund manager and they had, but they sorry, had, you're talking about Barry or Roger, which one was there at the beginning? Barry. Okay. Barry Hinckley. Um, and Roger came along later, uh, because we realized with 1.4 million, we needed somebody to help, like actually figure out like how are we going to like spend this money and how are we going to manage it? And we should probably get incorporated and all that. So it was, uh, yeah, so it was a good trio. Like Barry was really, uh, Roger was like a COO slash CFO. Barry was like super salesperson. And, uh, and then I was really the, the product lead and, uh, really did most of the coding up until, uh, up until we had revenue. Yep. So what year was first dollar of revenue? 2000. Okay. So you spent about 12 months kind of coding, learning. Uh, did you guys spend any of that, uh, angel money on, on the MVP as well? Do, like, can you quantify how much you spent on MVP? We blew all the angel money, like blew all the angel money on the first marketplace idea. <laughs> okay. So 1.5 million on an MVP. <laughs> yeah. Worse. Um, then we, we raised like nine, nine months in, we raised a uh, $4 million series a which was promptly blown um, on the original marketplace idea. All right, this must have so, been like extremely dilutive. Oh, it sucked. Can, I mean, can you, how bad was it? Like you're selling like 30% of the company between those two rounds back then? Because <laughs> um, you're pre-revenue. Sad. Yeah, it was like 30% of the company. Yeah. However, that it ended up being like 60 because we had to do a down round. So, so we pivoted with about a million dollars left in the bank and dramatically cut our expenses. And then we got our first dollar revenue and we went to our investors and we're like, we actually have revenue. And they were like, how big can software to the staffing industry be? <laughs> that business sucks. We are not investors. And not only that, if you raise money, we have an anti-dilution clause and a full ratchet. And so we did, we did a down round. So just um, to be various, clear, this was with the pension general electric pension fund for 628,000 bucks. You said it. This is back in the day. This is 2002. 2002. Yeah. And we did a very small, like 700 K round at a 50% haircut to the, the prior round. <laughs> ouch, ouch, ouch. And now wait, did they, did the, did the prior folks ratchet up? Did they, did they go ahead and buy their pro rata? They did. Okay. Yep. So then that was extra dilution. <laughs> so we got obliterated. Yeah. Like, so if fun exercises go plug that scenario into like a full waterfall for a, uh, you know, with a full ratchet, it's just, it was just horrible. I was, I couldn't understand. It took me like a week to get my head around like technically what was happening in the cap table. Um, but once I did, I was like, well, look, I actually really believe in this company is going to be a big company. Um, and we had, I had our first customer saying, this is amazing. You should sell this to every staffing firm in the world. We all have the same challenges. We all need an internet based system. And so we didn't, we didn't, the dilution hurt, but it didn't, ultimately we weren't really doing it for the money. Yep. You know? Well, how you old were you? How old were you at this point? Yeah, I was 20, uh, 25. Okay. So you're caught well, like 42 ish today, 43. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So let's fast forward to 2008. You take in 26 million from general catalyst Highland. What was revenue at that point? Um, we were, uh, 13 and a half trailing. Okay. And so that last, uh, little bit we raised, um, GE came along in 2005. was like, you guys are doing great. You need some more money. They gave us, um, so so it's funny, like the business they thought was horrible. Like they were like, oh, actually it's really great. Well, yeah, but you had four years there to turn around, right? Uh, so, so we raised one and a half then we didn't spend that. And then we got to 13 million and we were always profitable after 2003. So that one five was that, that was not another haircut. That was at a better valuation than that was the, an up, uh, that was at an up round. Yeah. And, uh, and then, um, and then Highland and General Catalyst came along and said, let's recapitalize the business. So, um, so GE was able to get out. And then. So part um, of that was secondary. 
yeah, a lot of it, most of it was secondary. Just buying out GE. GE and, and then uh, there was internet.com portfolio. So we outlasted our investors. They went out of business. And- Did, <laughs> that's pretty impressive, by the way. Did you and and your folks figure out how to get a chunk of the company back or did these guys Did, come in and still buy like 60%? Yeah, the guys were really great. They came in and they were like, look, you know, you're essentially a hired gun CEO yep. with your package. Let's, let's get you real equity in terms of options. And that was, I'm so glad they did that because, um, that, that had a pretty transformative effect. Oh, huge but, art. I mean, I'm doing the math on your full deal history. I'm going, I got to fix something had to have happened here for him and his folks to stay incentivized because there's no way they would have stuck. So kudos to general catalyst and Highland capital partners. You typically see this. They know damn well, if they're coming in and a founder owns less than half the company that they're going to be diluted to like nothing, lose interest. They said, you know what? Let's create an option pool post round. What obviously all the equity will probably vest. And did they, they didn't give it to you immediately. Did they? No, 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 it all vested. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was tied to a, a vesting. Structure. Can you share what size of that pool was? Obviously, it didn't all go to you guys. There's probably some for employees, but you're talking like 20%, 30% option pool? It was a 20% option pool. Okay, fair enough. So investors at this point were back down at like f- on a fully diluted basis, something like 40%. There was 20% up in the air that you guys could earn over a couple years. Best we're still 60%. We really got hammered. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so fast forward to 2012. Tell us what happened then. So then uh, Vista Equity comes along and says, I want to buy your business. And um, I, I was like, I'd never heard of Vista Equity. I didn't really understand private equity, how it was different from venture. I had heard all sorts of horrible stories uh, about how like they just cut costs and it's yeah. all about managing the EBITDA. And um, then I did some homework and I found out that that's not really what Vista is all about. And um, that was a pretty, you know, like like Highland coming in and, and sort of, you know, being really pro management and pro the company. Um, and so was, uh, so was Vista and that had a really positive effect and they allowed us to replatform our product, which at that point, you know, SAS 1.0 product had never been, uh, redesigned was still in cold fusion. What and was so they, ARR? What was ARR in 2012? Uh, 2012 was like 40, 40. Yeah. So I assume that this was called like 150, 200 million ish kind of deal. Um, I can't comment exact valuation. Oh, come on, dude. This was like a decade ago, almost uh, six years ago. <laughs> six years. You're still, go- you're still under NDAs. Quality. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's like when, the, the, it did leak that it was a nine figure deal. So yeah. And it wasn't high nine figures, obviously. Yeah. I mean, um, look, we'll, we'll move on past this. Is it, can we just put a cap? Can we say between a hundred and 500 million? Is that a fair range? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, okay. So what were the f- first off were you dealing and were you dealing with Robert or Brian? Cause Vista was kind of early, you know, now obviously everyone knows Vista, but Alan Klein was a uh, head of the foundation fund. Um, and I did have Robert and Brian on my board and those guys are all, all three of those guys are fan. Everybody at Vista I worked with was really great. It was a great experience. Okay, so here's my big question. Here's my here's my next big gap in your story that I was really looking forward to interviewing you about. Um, Vista will not let a cash flow positive uh, portfolio company go. Uh, you know, almost regardless of the premium. You know, their issue right now is they have to deploy fourteen billion dollars of capital, and if they find a good company, they're going to keep it. Why did they let you go to Insight? Yeah, good question. So we were the last investment to liquidate out of the Foundation One fund. So Foundation One was their first uh, their first fund that was geared at mid-sized growth companies, and all the other investments had been uh, huge home runs. And they were like, "Look, we can close down the fund. There's a lot of interest in Bullhorn." And once they closed down the fund, the returns on that fund were just unbelievable. Like it was an unbelievable fund. And so there was, I think there was a, there was a sense that if the price was right and, um, it was a a return that looked in line with the rest of the portfolio that, which, you know, they, they had some deals that were like 10 X. And so it was a really, it was a good outcome. Yep. Okay. What, so what, and what year was that with insight? That was, uh, just a year, just over a year and a half ago. Okay. So, so call it 28, 17, 17, 18. It was the end of Thanksgiving 17. 
Yep. And right before you did that deal. So while you were under kind of Vista's arm between 2012 and 2017, what did you go revenues to? We started revenues at 40 and we ended at 130. Okay. So 2017, you guys were going to do it 130. And then today, obviously up over 220. What were the first two things that Insight helped you do in the company that you would have not learned from anyone else except Insight? Yeah. So, um, well, one of the big things that we did when we were closing the deal with Insight was we did a really strategic acquisition. Um, and I think being uh, having a new a new partner, their appetite to go after something that had a very long range uh, impact to revenue, but was strategic, like, hey, you're going to get into a new, whole new product line and it's going to take time to make that happen. Are, are you talking PeopleNet or Connexus? PeopleNet. PeopleNet, yeah. At Vista, we did... We did Connexus with Vista, and then PeopleNet was with Insight. Okay, uh, and um, and so that one was like a really transfer. The other thing that Insight did, which I thought was cool, was they came in. They're like, um, "Hey guys, what about AI?" And we're like, "Look, you know, we we really we have some stuff going on with AI, but we're not investing a ton because we're not venture backed." And, uh, you know, we want to generate EBITDA and insight was like, look, like you can't be a software company and not be investing in AI. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so they, they took sort of the progressive move of saying like, let's right size that investment so that you're positioned to give your customers the benefit of all the things that you can do with AI. And so, so that's been, that's been really cool. So fast forward, we're almost back up now to where we're at today, but let's go back one year ago today. So north of 200 million bucks in AR today. Do you remember where you were at a year ago? Um, where did we end last year? It's blurry for me <laughs> because, because, uh, because of, we did a lot of acquisitions last year. So yeah, no, you guys did. I mean, I'm looking at I mean, Talent Rover, Job Signs, and 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 Vinius or something like that. You got, we got to rebrand that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I'm just, I'm just trying to get a general sense of uh, year over year growth rate. So I mean, did you guys obviously doubling at this scale is extremely difficult. You're more probably in the twenty to thirty percent range. Yeah, that's exactly where we are. Yeah. Okay. So 20, 20 percent year over year growth. Um, now, one of the things I like to look at with companies at your scale, you know, I've had read you on with C event. I've had a couple other folks on with 200 to 400, 500 million in ARR. They're all thinking about E40 metrics relative to public SaaS companies, obviously, because most of the addressable market. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, so what's your E metric? Okay, good. So you're E50, uh, which means, which means if you're doing 20 percent year over year growth, you've got to be taking 30 percent EBITDA margins. Yeah, or 2525. Or 2525. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, that's great. So uh, w moving forward, right? Um, help me understand some other things here. So a lot of growth at your scale can come from expansion revenue. Um, are you driving a meaningful expansion revenue now? And do you see that as a growth channel or more of your growth is going to come from new customers? Yeah, we, you know, it's interesting. Like we were all new logo sales for the first decade, maybe even 15 years. And, um, you know, you get to a point where you realize like, my customers buy other software products. And so it, it, it takes a while for the organization to shift to say, okay, I'm going to go spend time with my existing customers and try and upsell them. And, um, but once you do, you discover that there's this whole new gear for growth. Um, and so that's been, so part of the, part of the acquisition strategies, like the people net acquisition gave us two new product lines. Um, the, uh, that there were some acquisitions we did a couple of years ago that uh, gave us two product lines. And so those are really starting to take off in the customer base now. Okay. But there's a lot of work you have to do. Like we had to do a lot of R and D to take a product that was standalone successful with a hundred customers and make it scale to, you know, how's it going to flow into 10,000 customers and yep. you know, how it's going to work. So if you peel back this onion for me here for a second, if you look over the past 12 months, just uh, gross, so ignore expansion for a second, gross revenue churn, are we talking like 10-ish percentage or what was that number? Uh, we're, we're in the low 90s gross and around 100% net. Okay, got it. So just obviously that's not churn, that's retention. So you're retaining about call it 92, 93 ish percent or churning seven or eight percent annually. And then you're just said your expansion is also seven or eight percent for hundred percent net. Yeah, and and I would say the expansion number is the one that we think in the next couple of years could go to 
you know, we could be at 110, 115. Well, I was just going to push you on that in a very polite way. Look, most folks at your scale, you're, you're seeing it. And especially at these ACV sizes, you're seeing expansion revenue world-class, I'd say is between 20 and 30% annually. And you're significantly below that. Why haven't you driven more expansion revenue, especially with all your acquisitions? Yeah. So I, I mean, my, my quick answer to that is, um, like I said about the R and D when we first bought our first add-on acquisitions, we did not sink the kind of R and D that we needed to into it. And so now what you're seeing is like, we're, we're, the ramp is, is high. I mean, that was the upsell factor was probably like three, 4% mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. And so now it's starting to ramp. So it's growing. It absolutely should be like you know, 20, 30 percent. Yeah, you guys can get there. I mean, the, I would I would say that's a massive part of your growth story in the next is the next five years. I mean, you, that's just money on the table for you guys. You've been, our, you've been sitting in our management meetings. Yeah, good. That's good. I have, I have little birdies everywhere, you know. All right. Uh, some other questions here about aggressiveness. CAC. So let's role play here for a twenty thousand dollar ACV account. Will you spend the full 20 grand up front to get them? What do you like to optimize payback period yeah. for? And we'll spend about 25, uh, 22, 22, five to 25 depends on the segment. So bigger customers, more expensive. So you'll spend up to 25, you know, a dollar 50 yep. to acquire a dollar of recurring revenue. Smaller customers, you'll spend about a dollar 10, maybe yep. a buck. Okay. Love that. And are you generally getting more aggressive there or less aggressive? Um, in the enterprise, we're getting more aggressive and in the SMB, it's all about like, how do you focus on driving the efficiency. Yeah. So you know, I the right customers, right? Like the high turn customers, how do you avoid signing them up and putting a lot of effort and energy into, into that? Did you spend much time when you were with Vista? I, I don't know if this was before their time, but with like Reggie at Cvent or Andre at Ping Identity or Bill at Media Ocean, those guys are no. I, uh, I, I know Reggie and, uh, and Andre. Okay. And I've met Bill, but I don't. The only reason I ask, the only reason I ask is Andre and, and Reggie both, when I had them on, I pushed them on this and they said, yeah, one of the things they're doing is they're driving, uh, you know, they're driving up even to sometimes $2 for a new dollar of AR because they're driving competitors out of their distribution channels. And once the competitors leave those channels because they've made it so expensive, they just drop the CAC back down. Are you doing any of that tactically in any channels? We haven't had to do that. Okay. And the market dynamics might be different in our, our market. Yep. But that's, we, I'll tell you, when we add sales and marketing heads, we don't see a dramatic, like our ramp is pretty quick. And so maybe they're more enterprise focused. And so I think it, and, it, and if you have competitors who can really give you a run for your money in the enterprise, like that's. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. Let's, you just mentioned ramp time. Let's talk about team quick and then we'll wrap up. Um, team size today, how many people total? Uh, we're just under a thousand. Okay. And how many are engineers versus quota carrying folks? Um, good question. Off the top of my head, I would say there's probably in the R and D team about, uh, 200 okay. and then sales is about 160. And what do you optimize your pro form as like per salesperson? When you look at salesperson profitability, right? So compare their on target earnings, right? When they hit quota, their full comp relative to their bookings targets. Is it like generally like a five X multiple you're optimizing for a 10 X or what? Yeah. So, um, it's, in the SMB, it's about three to three and a half. And then in the enterprise, it's a full five. That's pretty good. Okay, good. Good stuff. Anything that I should have asked you about, like like metrics you're looking at that I've been asked about, or you're like, you missed this? Um, yeah, I mean, the one we look at a lot is CAC to LTV. Um, and so, and especially by segment. So if we're talking about a large customer, the, the CAC to LTV, and I, I I exclude upsells from that. I just look at sort of like, you know, what's the cost to acquire the initial customer? You're extrapolating first year ACV. Well, and, and also like the upsells really blur, like, okay, you know, you had churn over here. So you, you'll end up with like an infinite CAC to LT, LTV to CAC. And so I like to look at it sort of a raw basis. And that for us has been a really good metric in like, the SMB, we were good, but not great. And it's allowed us to become great. And in the enterprise, we're, we're, we're you know, excellent, amazing. Like, what you know, do you consider excellent? Well, like, you get 1% churn and it costs you $2. And so you keep the customer for like 99 years. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> right? Excel, but, Excel, uh, Excel sheets are not your friend in this case, because it gets very unrealistic very quickly. 
yeah, so you could spend ninety nine dollars acquiring the customer and break even. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, but, as long as you can manage the cash gap, which potentially with private equity backers you can. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Debt is free. So, so when are, when are you going to IPO? Uh, I don't know. It's not really on my mind because the private markets are so good. And um, yeah, but how do you personally get rich? I mean, one of the things I always like is how founders get personally rich and early employees and all employees. Like, how do they get rich? And like, you give up so much early on. Now, you strike me as a guy that likes learning. You're probably learning a ton still. So that's one factor, right? But like, the other is like, how do you make personal wealth from this? Well, I mean, there's plenty of personal wealth in private equity deals. You can sell a little bit of your stock and reload with options. Did you with the inside deal? Some of it was secondary? You know, with the Vista deal, I did quite a bit okay. and, uh, and regretted that actually, um, like enormously because, you know, you saw what happened to the revenue, right? Yeah. Like had I just held on, um, but you know, when you're, when yeah, you're, you're like 30, you're like 37 at that point, 36. Yeah, that's right. So, but like, um, you know, so now for me, it's, it's definitely just about having fun and building a great company. And the, really, I think more about like the legacy of like the, like, what are the employees going to say about their experience at Bullhorn? Like, yep. and I think, you know, of course people like people on my team are like, yeah, we're going to get paid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, and are, you're, you're a young guy. I mean, you have one or two more hits in you, I would say after this, and they probably be big successes based on all you learn. So we'll see what happens. I just did, we just did our 20th, this is actually August is our 20th anniversary. So I don't know, man, I, I may, I may not have any hits. I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, man, let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, uh, winning by Jack Welsh. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, I find Benioff intriguing. Yep. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the company? Online tool for building the company. Oh, that's a tough question. I don't know that I use. I must use some online tool. Google Docs? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, I get a solid seven to eight. Okay. And situation, married, single kids? Married kids. How many kiddos? Two kids. Two. Boy and a girl. Oh, good. And how old are you? Uh, 40, 43. Three, oh, good. I got that right on the nose earlier. That's pretty good. All right. 43. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh, uh, how anti-dilution worked. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, bullhorn.com founded in 99, raised 4 million early on, basically sold 60% of the company before going on, having a lot of success. And now over $200 million in ARR up 30% year over year. Essentially their E40 metric is about E50, 25% EBITDA margin, 25% year over year growth at this scale, obviously pretty impressive thousand folks on the team, uh, 7% annual gross revenue churn, 8% expansion. As they look to drive more expansion revenue over time with more acquisitions. Now that they're part of the insight family. Art, thank you for taking us to the top. All right. Thanks.